All right, welcome back to thecloudchurch.org. I'm Robert Breaker, Mr. Evangelist of Spanish and English speaking people. And we are in Galatians chapter 3, going verse by verse through the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written. Last time we made it all the way to verse 16. So we finished in verse 16. And what we'll do now is we're going to start in verse 17 and hopefully finish this chapter. This has been a rather long chapter to get through because there's so much in this chapter. Galatians is such a great book to show us the importance of salvation by faith and how we are not saved by works. There are no works whatsoever involved for salvation or to be saved in the church age. Now, now I'm not saying that you shouldn't do any works. After you're saved you work because you're saved, not to get saved or to stay saved. You do work for Jesus because you love him and you appreciate what he's done for you. You work because of grace not because you have to do works to get to heaven. I serve him because I'm saved, not to get saved. That's the difference. So in Galatians chapter 3, we finished up last time in verse 16. And I'll just go ahead and read 16 again. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. And we saw last time how God made a promise to Abraham of a seed. And how that seed was a dual application. He actually had literally seed from Abraham that were the, the physical children of Israel. But then through Jesus Christ, salvation is offered to us. And when we receive Jesus Christ, we are spiritually made of the seed of Abraham. As in verse 29. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, I'm definitely Christ, so I am Abraham's seed and heir of the promise. Uh, heir of the promise. Now we also saw that there was two different promises. One was a promise to Israel of the land. And that's why I left my map up here. This is the land of Israel and God said from all the way up here from the river the Tigris Euphrates all the way down to the great river the Nile all that land God promised forever to the Jews. That's their land. But to us that are Christians what do we receive? Well the blessing, the spiritual blessing we receive is eternal life. Through the cross of Calvary, we're saved and receive eternal life. Now, you notice I don't have my timeline up here. I've got something different. We're going to kind of look at this today as we finish out chapter 3, hopefully finish chapter 3. So, we read 16, kind of get the context of where we're studying. So, we'll begin in verse 17. And so, 17, Galatians 3, 17. And this I say that the covenant, all right, we looked at the covenant last time. And what it was, I just explained to you, the two parts of the covenant, one physical, one spiritual. The physical is the land of Israel, the spiritual is eternal life. We receive the promise by faith. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law. Okay, well now it's talking about the law of Moses. Which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of God, none, uh, the promise of none effect. So now he switches up and turns from the promise for Abraham. Now he says, now let me tell you about the law. And Paul mentions a number. He says the law that was 430 years after. After what? Well, there's a guy named Clarence Larkin that wrote a good book. Uh, this is the greatest book on dispensational truth in all the world. And Clarence Larkin had an idea that is the whole Bible is set up in increments of 490 years. Well, what is so important about 490? Well, 490 is 70 times 3. Uh, excuse me, times 7. And God always uses that number seven. And he went through the Bible and he found every 490 years something happened. That's an interesting thought. But I'm just going to show you an example of some of the 490 years. We're not going to go through the entire Bible. But here, it's telling us, it says, it's talking about, I say the covenant which confirmed before Christ, or before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none of God, of none effect. Well, after what? Well, when Abraham was about 70 years old, that's when God gave the promise, and 430 years later, Paul mentions, 430 years later, after God promised the promise to Abraham, that'd be 490 years later, there was something that happened. It was the Exodus, in which God used Moses, and he brought the people of Israel out of bondage. And as soon as he brought them out of bondage, what did he do? God gave them the law. So there was a law given, and the law, well, of course, is the law that they had to follow in the Old Testament. Now, after that, there was about 490 years, and 
there was a lot of things that happened as they took over the land. I, if I remember right, this is about the book of Judges and such. But as we looked at, and if you get a chance to go to cloudchurch.org, go to past sermons, look at the one called Dispensations, you'll see that in the different dispensations, they always start out good, and then they end up bad, and God has to start over and bring them up again. So how did this end? Well, it ended in apostasy. And because of apostasy, they ended up um, having to, to start over. So there's always apostasy. The time of the judges was a time of apostasy, and God had to do something. So there's always the apostasy, and people mess up, and then God has to start over. But after about 490 years, then they dedicated the temple. So we see the temple, the dedication of the temple with Solomon. And what happened after that? Well, Solomon ended up in apostasy, we know. And uh, he was serving other gods because he married so many women and everything. But they went into apostasy. They went into, if I remember correct, this is when they, they went into bondage in Babylon. And then what happened? Well, they were in Babylon and they were away. And then after 70 years, they finally got to come back. And that's when the edict to rebuild Jerusalem was given. That's where we find uh, Nehemiah and Ezra and all that and how they come back and rebuild Israel. Well, then after that, the Bible is very, very specific in the book of Daniel that in 483 years, something very specific was going to take place. What was that? That was the Messiah coming and being cut off or dying on the cross. Well, Jesus died in 33 A.D., but that book of Daniel was very specific that that 490 over here will be split up and there will be an extra seven years at the end. And so it's 483 years here and then seven years are lacking. And what are those seven years? That's what we call the tribulation. So the Bible is just an amazing book. You go through the Bible, it gives you genealogy from Adam all the way down. And if you look from Adam to Jesus Christ, it's about 4,000 years. So let me write it out down here. Here's Adam. Here's Jesus. And from Adam to the birth of Jesus, see Jesus died in 33 AD. From Adam to Jesus, if you follow all the genealogies, there's only about 4,000 years. So that means over here in the church age after Jesus, there's only been close to 2,000 years. And that means over here, the millennium is going to be 1,000 years. That means there's only around 7,000 years of human history. Evolution is not in the Bible, by the way, and evolution is a lie. Evolution says there's millions upon millions upon millions of years. But all, God always works with sevens. And up until around the 1800s, all Christians believed that there hadn't been that long of human history, just thousands of years. Bishop Usher, I believe in the 17. Uh, 1800, somewhere around that time, wrote a book in which he followed the genealogy of Jesus and he said, there's only going to be 7,000 years of human history according to the prophecies of the Bible. And that's how it works out. Now, if you don't want to believe that, that's fine, but the Bible has proven itself true time and again, so I will follow the Bible. So God has this thing set up in such a way that he can tell us the past, the present, and the future. And we know, although we might not know the exact date, because the church age is a parenthetical time. We don't know when the rapture is going to take place. But we do know that after the rapture takes place, there's only going to be seven years left until Jesus returns at the Battle of Armageddon. And then he sets up his millennial kingdom where he'll rule and reign. But isn't it neat to know that you know history before it even happens if you follow the Bible? It's just kind of interesting to me, these 490 periods. I never really got into that study that deeply. I'm just kind of giving a little overview of it. Because um, some people say, well, it won't work out. There's a year or two too many this way or too many that. I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing out there what I read and how interesting it is. 490, 490, 490. And then over here is the other Jewish 490 years. And it's split because of the church age. So that last seven years of that 490 years will be in the future. And by the way, I left my map up here from last time. And uh, so I kind of run it into my map. But uh, I'm so proud of that. I'm not a good artist and that map looks really nice so I just went ahead and left it. Okay, so Genesis chapter 3 and in Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after so the law was 430 years after the promise that God gave to Abraham and Abraham must have been alive so about 490 years. It says, <clears throat> can cannot disannul, 
that it should make the promise of none effect. Now what is the promise? The promise to us in the church age is eternal life. We receive eternal life and we receive the Holy Spirit by faith. That's the promise. So the promise is the Holy Spirit and eternal life. And how do we get that? By faith. Alright, so that's telling us that back here, the law cannot disannul this. So the law can't take this away from us. Under the law, they couldn't have eternal life. They didn't get life under the law. As a matter of fact, the law was just a system of works that you had to do in it. There was no life in it. Go to our um, sermon on the cloud, cloudchurch.com uh, dot org uh, entitled "Where Did the Dead Go?" Go to past sermons because that's clear that even under the law, they couldn't even go to heaven when they died. They had to go to Abraham's bosom. So it's interesting how it all ties together. So <clears throat> it says, "Cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect." Thank God, this promise is true. It's going to take place. If you trust Jesus as your Savior, you will receive eternal life and have the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, verse 18, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So what is the inheritance? The inheritance to the Jews under Abraham is this land of Israel. And we aren't under the law because the law was to Jews. So we don't inherit that land, but we inherit eternal life through, through the seed of of Abraham through the spiritual side. But it says, be of the law. It is no more of promise. Well, God promised Abraham. But under the law, we read about them owning the land and what they should do. So the law mentions the land and tells them what they have to do. As a matter of fact, the law says, you must build a temple, a tabernacle in that land and do certain things. So they couldn't even follow the law unless they're in the land. And it's interesting that they got back into the land in 1948. Now here's something interesting. Today, the Jews are in the land, but they have no tabernacle built. So what are they going to do? Well, that's what the Bible talks about in the book of, uh, in the book of Revelation. In the tribulation, they're going to try to rebuild their temple, and the Bible says they'll be sacrificing and worshiping in that temple. So that's not done yet. Now when that's done, that's when you start looking up. If it suddenly came out on the news tomorrow, the Jews have rebuilt their tabernacle, have built their temple. That's when we start looking up, because that's when it all starts falling in place, when God says that the tribulation is going to start taking place, when he starts dealing with the Jews and not dealing with the church anymore. You see, this whole thing is about the Jews from Abraham. It's all for the Jews. This is just a little parenthetical for us today to be saved. What a great time in history to be saved, when we as Gentiles could be saved. Because if you wanted to get saved in these other times, you would have had to become a Jew and you would have had to have been circumcised and follow the law. So, it's not by the law, but by the promise that you receive certain things. So, what does that tell us about the law? The law doesn't give us anything. The law is just a harsh, harsh master. Go to um, verse 18 again. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? Yeah, you know, what's the law for? What's it, what's it good for? What serveth the law? What, what is the law even for? Well, the law of Moses was for the Jews, and as we'll see in a minute, it was to point them to that promised seed. I don't know if you remember or not, but last time we looked at the promise that God gave to, to Adam and Eve. Genesis 3.15, a promised seed. And so just as God promised Abraham something, God promised Adam and Eve something. And that promise, that seed, came to pass in Jesus Christ because he's the promised seed or the Messiah. Messiah, by the way, means anointed one. And so that promised seed is the anointed one, Jesus Christ. And we'll see that through the law, the Jews, they, they saw, hey, this Jesus, he's the one that came in the time that the law said he would come. And Daniel and other books, he exactly showed up at the exact time period that the Bible prophesied. And even still, the Jewish religious leaders didn't want to believe it when it was right there in front of their eyes. What's funny is um, you get Clarence Larkin's commentary on the book of Daniel, and uh, it talks about in Daniel how the book of Daniel prophesied Alexander the Great. And that when Alexander the Great came down here through all this area from over here in Greece and Asia Minor and was taking all this over, he showed up in Jerusalem. And when he showed up in Jerusalem, the priest opened the gates of Jerusalem and came right out and said, Hello, 
They said, you must be the one that's prophesied right here in the book of Daniel to do this, this, and this. You're the he-goat. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? They were reading their Bibles, and they knew, yeah, in the book of Daniel, it tells us there's going to be this he-goat that comes in and does all these things. And they were reading their Bibles, and they knew the time periods, and they said, yeah, you're him that's right here in this book. You're prophesied. Well, that must have filled him up with pride, huh? Matter of fact, uh, Alexander Great thought for years that he was a god. He actually declared himself a god, which is ridiculous. But um, he was in the Bible. It will prophesy to him. Well, it also prophesies to someone else out here in the future in the tribulation. And we can do like those Jews back there. We can take our Bible and look and say, hey, this might be that guy right here that's prophesied there. Some people try to do that with Obama. And say, oh, look at that Obama, Barack Hussein Obama. Why, he must be the Antichrist because all these things that it says in Daniel and all the things that are happening in Revelation, he seems to be the one closest that's going to do that. Is he? I don't know. Could be somebody else, but... He's a pretty strong candidate as you look through the verses of the Bible. And guess what he's against? He's against Israel. He has more of a Muslim background, so he hates Israel. Doesn't want to even speak with Netanyahu and all these things. Well, could that be that he is going to... Hmm, it's interesting. So we're just going to keep reading our Bibles and look and see if that doesn't turn out that way. So verse 19 in Galatians chapter 3 says, Wherefore then serveth the law? Yeah, what good is the law even for today? The law is good for nothing today where we are. But the law was good back there because the law had a purpose. Hey, it's all about the promised seed. Okay, so what then serveth the law? Where was I? Verse 17. And this I say that the covenant... I'm sorry, I skipped back. Verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator ordained by angels in the hand of a meteor. Now, some of the Old Testament was written by angels coming and talking to people. As a matter of fact, Daniel was visited by angels and told what to write. So maybe that's what it's talking about. i, I be honest with you, I don't know what it means, ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. But I do know that verse 20 tells us, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. And I do know that in 1 Timothy 2, 5, we find that Jesus Christ is the mediator. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So what does it say? There is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is the mediator? Jesus Christ. Now I'm sorry, Mr. Catholic, the Catholic Church says, no, there's two mediators, and Mary is a co-redeemer, redeemer, a co-mediatrix, or some word like that they make up. Well, then, now I'm forced to choose between a religion and the Bible. Uh, no-brainer, I'll reject the Catholic Church and follow the Bible, because the Bible tells me there's one God and one mediator. So when they say there's two and Mary's the other one, I say, no, the Bible says there's one. And that one is Jesus Christ. And then verse 6 there, who gave himself a ransom for all. Well, you, then we've got another problem. we got another big group in the world that starts with a C. They call themselves Calvinists. And Calvinists say, well, Jesus only died for a certain group and not everybody. Well, this verse says he gave himself a ransom for all. So let me see. Should I choose to follow a religion that says something against the Bible or follow the Bible? Hmm, no brainer. See a Calvinist, I'm going to follow the Bible. Jesus Christ died for all, for every person that ever lived, past, present, and future. And anyone that says otherwise is going against the scriptures. So Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and men. So now we go back to Galatians chapter 3. It's, it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Is that shadowing Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? Does that show us that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament was Jesus Christ? It's interesting. Let's back up a second and um, Let's go to verse 19 again. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. It was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So if that's speaking of Jesus Christ, does that mean that Jesus Christ was prophesied of in the Old Testament? As a matter of fact, does the law prophesy of Jesus? We talked about that a few minutes ago. Well, let's look up a couple verses that talk about that. Go to John chapter 1 and verse 45. Because what you'll find is, thank God for the law. Even though we're not under the law today, that doesn't mean we shouldn't read it. We should read the Old Testament. 
I get mad with people that say, well, all you do is talk about Paul, and so that's all you do. You read Paul's books, and you don't read the rest of the Bible. So they, they think all you do is read Romans to Philemon, and you don't read any other part of the Bible. That's not true. I read the whole Bible through, over and over. I know that that's written specifically for me, for the doctrine of the church today, but that doesn't mean I don't read the law. I go to the law and read the law, and this is why. John chapter 1 and verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom the Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Je uh, Joseph. Did you get that? Here's Jesus in his earthly ministry, and up shows a guy and says, We finally found the one that the law and the prophets speak about. So obviously Jesus Christ is spoken of in the law and in the prophets. So I read the Old Testament so I can see Jesus in it. And I can see, oh, that's what prophesied of him. I can see that. Do you know when they read that, they couldn't see it because it hadn't happened yet? The Bible says they were blinded. But now that it's all happened, we read that Old Testament, and it's fun to read the Old Testament because we see the prophecies in the future of Jesus. Now, we're not saved by the law, but that doesn't mean we don't read it. This is our doctrine for today. This is our apostle for today, Paul. But that doesn't mean we don't read the rest of the Bible. We do read the best of the rest of the Bible. Now, Luke chapter 24. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. I'm in John, so I need to go back. Luke 24, 44. Check this out. And he said unto them, right? Or he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. So this is Jesus Christ talking. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So Jesus Christ said, there's three Old Testament books that were the law of Moses, the prophets, and then he says the Psalms. So all these Old Testaments fall into one of these categories. And guess what they all do? They all prophesy of Jesus. So why wouldn't we read them? We read them to find Jesus in them. And to say, wow, isn't that cool how God's so smart he prophesied of himself hundreds, sometimes even thousands of years before. And up he shows and he fulfilled that. And we can see it clearly looking back. So don't tell me, oh, you guys don't read the rest of the Bible. We read all of the Bible. But we don't follow one part of the Bible. We don't follow the law because the law is not for us. We follow the writings of Paul, but we don't, that doesn't mean we don't write, read the rest of it. We do. And when we read, we do what the Bible calls rightly dividing. 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. Go to um, John 5.31. Jesus Christ, excuse me, John 5.39. John 5.39, Jesus Christ talking. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Well, when he was talking, Jesus Christ was here in his earthly ministry, there were no New Testament books written. So when he says, search the scriptures, he's saying, search the law, the prophets, Psalms, read all the Old Testament books, because they testify of me, Jesus Christ says. What a confession. i got a note here for, for Romans 16.25. Let's go there. Romans 16.25. Romans 16.25 says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So there was a mystery back here in the Old Testament. But yet, it still pointed to Jesus Christ. What was that mystery? Well, it was the church. They didn't know about it. But these old prophets and everything, they were reading that, and it all was there. We can go back and read it now and find it, but to them it was a mystery. They didn't realize the church age, what is that? That's why when Jesus Christ came, they didn't see the church age. All they saw was the millennium in the future, and they thought, he's coming back to sit on his throne right here. I didn't realize that all this had to take place first. Now let's look at a couple of other places where the scriptures talk about uh, Jesus in the Old Testament. Acts 24, 14. Acts 24, 14. Speaking is, is the Apostle Paul. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. Why would he say, I believe everything that's written in the law and the prophets? Because they all pointed to Jesus Christ. 
So he was reading the Old Testament and taking people of the Old Testament and showing them Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Acts chapter 28, verse 23. Very end, toward the end of the ministry of Paul, and he's stuck in Rome, and look what he's doing in Rome. When they had appointed him a day, there came many unto him, many to him, unto his lodging, and to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Even Paul used the Old Testament. He would take people, because the New Testament hadn't all been set in stone yet. There might have been one or two books written. But he was saying, look, all these books that God gave to us Jews, they all tell us that Jesus Christ is the one to look for. And they all tell us that he's the Messiah, and we must trust him as our Savior. So it's interesting how, don't say, well, you don't read any other books, but Paul, we do. You can take someone to the Old Testament and prove to them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's why we should read the Old Testament, to see Christ in it. So now we go back to Galatians chapter 3, and verse 19. And, um, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Verse 20, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. And God is the mediator. Verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So the law wasn't against the promise made back here. But the law tried to force people under something, and the, the law prophesied of what would come, the promise. So the law, as the church age was the parenthetical uh, age here where things were different, the law was where things were different here. Before the law, they were under grace still. And they had to do works. And there was this promise. And then God says, alright, this promise is going to be way out here, but I want you to go into the law. Because even the law, even more, pointed to Jesus. And we're going to see that in a minute, how the law points us to Christ. That's what the law is for, to point us to Jesus. So out here... Jesus should have come to start this, but then there was this parenthetical. There was the church age there. So it's kind of neat how God puts little speed bumps in the road of history before he gets to the ultimate goal of where he wants to go. So, <clears throat> Galatians, um, chapter 3 and verse 21. God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, barely righteousness should have been by the law. So, the question is, does the law give you eternal life? And the answer is, no. Eternal life only comes through faith in Jesus Christ, trusting His blood atonement, the death, burial, resurrection, the gospel. That's when you receive the Holy Spirit. Didn't receive the Holy Spirit back here, but you receive it here. Now, I say that, but some people got it. David got the Holy Spirit. Uh, Samson back here. It came and went on people back here. Here, when it comes, it stays. You're sealed. So there's no sealing of the Holy Spirit back then. Now, verse 22. But the scripture has concluded, hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So how are we saved? How do we receive the promise? By faith. And it says the promise of faith, and then it says to them that believe. So it's saying believe and faith are the same thing. So what does that mean? That means when you believe, you're having faith. And when your faith is in Christ, then you believe Him as your Savior. Okay, so let's look at that again and start at the beginning. I kind of passed over a little bit there. Verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. All under sin. What does that mean? Are we all sinners? Are you telling me that the Bible is saying that everyone is a sinner? Well, that's exactly right. I've run into people sometimes and... And, you know, the first thing you want to ask them, hey, man, are you a sinner? Because Jesus Christ came to save sinners, so a person can't get saved until they first see they're a sinner. And uh, how many times I've asked people, hey, man, are you a sinner? And they go, oh, no. <laughs> I mean, how can somebody think, I'm not a sinner? And it's just so funny when, when you ask somebody, are you a sinner? They go, oh, no. You go, oh, really? Well, I guess you are now. What? I'm not a sinner? What do you say? Uh, well, now you are. You just lied. Because the Bible says all the sinner are sinners. So I guess you're a liar. You might not have ever sinned before, but you just did now by, by lying. <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's a funny way to deal with people. But what does the Bible say? Are all sinners? Well, yes. Uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No. In no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. We just read that in Galatians. All are under sin. Um, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So, we're all under sin, but we're all can be saved by faith, by believing. So, interesting. Well, we're in Romans. Let's go to Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So if you say, I have never sinned, you are a liar. The Bible says every man, woman, and child in this world, well, man and woman, uh, child might be uh, before the uh, age of accountability, might not have sinned yet, but every human being that's reached the age of accountability has sinned and is a sinner. And it's a sin to say, well, I'm not a sinner. And so back to um, Galatians 3.22, what does the Bible teach us? It teaches us that salvation is by faith, by believing. So there's faith and believing are about the same thing. But you have to understand that believing must come from the heart. You see, there's some people that don't realize that you can use the word believe and mean two different things with it. You can believe from the head, and that's just knowing something, or you can believe from the heart. When you believe from the heart, you're practicing faith. And what is that? That's trusting in something. But if you believe only from the head, then you're not saved. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go to James chapter 2 and verse 19. James chapter 2 and verse 19. James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. Yeah, we should all believe in God. It says, The devils also believe and tremble. What? The devils believe? What, what, do you, what does that mean? Well, the devils believe there's a God in their head. That is, they know that there's literally a God. Matter of fact, He created them. So they know there's a God. Are they trusting? Are they believing? Is there faith in that God? No. So even though they believe, that's the, the, the use of the word of knowing in their head, they don't believe from the heart. So that's what salvation is. It's trusting and believing, and that believing must come from the heart. That's why in Acts, let's go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, in verse 36, I believe, 37. Oh, I'm in Romans, no wonder. Acts 8. And uh, verse 37. Now the question is, what, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So it wasn't just a head knowledge, it was a heart knowledge. And that's what believing and faith are. They're trusting from the heart in Jesus Christ. And that's a question that needs to be answered by you watching this video. Have you believed in Jesus Christ? You just believe in him from your head. You just believe, yeah, I believe he died on the cross one time. And, you know, that's public knowledge. I believe that. And you believe it up here? Or do you believe it here? In the sense that you believe that truly happened and it was for you in your place. And you're trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection to save you. Uh, one old preacher said the difference between heaven and hell is sometimes about 18 inches. Of course, I'm kind of short, so that looks more like about 16, 17 inches. But see the difference? You can believe in your head the gospel and die and go to hell, because you never believed from the heart. Uh, Romans chapter 10 real quick. Twice, this is so important, Romans chapter 10. It says in Romans 10 and verse 9, If thou shalt believe in thine heart, in verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So salvation is a heart issue. And that's why it's important to be under conviction and to pray and ask God to, to convict you of your sin. You ought to feel bad about it. And... Uh, you know, then it's something from the heart. It's believing from the heart. It's, wow, for my entire being, everything that I am, I give up trusting in my works, and I trust completely in Him. That's salvation. All right, <clears throat> so back to um, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 in verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. All right, so before faith, you're under sin and under the law. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which would afterwards be revealed. So these people under the law, they must not have had faith. So how were they saved? Works. And they were shut up under that. So they were under a system that they had to follow and do works in order to be accepted by God. But then faith came. 
So what does that mean? That means there was a gigantic change and that we are no longer under the law. I just I can't stress that enough because so many people in this world who claim to be Christians say, no, we're under the law. We've got to keep the law. If you're under the law, then why did Jesus die? The law was to point us to Christ. And when we come to Christ, we're no longer under the law. We're going to see that in the verses that follow. So why do they want to get people under the law? That's what the entire book of Galatians is about. False brethren, unaware, entered into the church and said, you've got to keep the law. And Paul went ballistic. You foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? What are you, fools, to believe such a crazy thing? The law's over. It's done. It's finished. Forget it. Come to Jesus. Grace through faith. No more are we under the law. And yet Christians can't even see that. I guess they haven't read the book of Galatians. So Galatians chapter 20, uh, 3, 22, But the scripture hath concluded all of their sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So when we believe is when we're saved. But before faith, which was under the law, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which would afterwards be, should be revealed. Wherefore? Wherefore? Verse 24 is so important. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So we're justified by faith and not by the law. So the law was before faith. Faith alone is how we're saved. That was revealed after the law. So how are we saved? By faith and not by the law. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 through 12. 1 Peter 1, 10. So salvation here is by faith alone and not by works. And you know what? These people in the Old Testament, even if they heard this, they'd go, wow, that's crazy. So it's funny that we today, we're saved by faith, and someone says, you've got to get into the law. We say, hey, that's crazy. <laughs> it's because there was a change that took place. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So in the Old Testament, they prophesied about this, and they searched diligently, but they just couldn't understand it. They couldn't see it. They were like, what does that mean, say, without works? What? 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did testify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So here we see the Holy Spirit in them. And I told you earlier that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon a person and left. And here today, it doesn't leave. But under the law... They might have gotten the Spirit, and that's what spoke through them to write the words of God, but then it left. So, Old Testament, Spirit can come and leave, come and leave, come and leave. But today, you cannot lose the Holy Spirit. The promise is you receive the Holy Spirit, and you're sealed by faith. Now, most of these people that kept the law, they didn't ever have the Holy Spirit. But the prophets, the ones that are actually writing the Scriptures, God came into them and spoke through them, and, and through their hand wrote the law. So it's important that you see the distinction. Distinction. Some people had the Holy Spirit back in, but they didn't have it forever. It came and went. Under the law, very few people had the Holy Spirit, if any. Only the ones writing the law had the Spirit. But those that were obeying the law did not receive the Spirit through the law. And over here we receive the Holy Spirit and we keep it and it can't leave. So it says, um, Unto whom it was revealed, verse 12, and not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Huh, so much in those verses. that even over here, all this is taking place, and all the angels are in heaven looking down and going, this is wild. And then God's using them to prophesy of a coming time of grace over here, in which people are saved a different way. Say by faith alone and receiving the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit stays and doesn't come and go. And the angels are looking into that going, what is, what, what's that all about? What are you doing, God? <laughs> They're trying to figure it out. And God goes, hey, it's a mystery. I'll reveal it to you later. I know what I'm doing. And he did. So back to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law had one reason and one purpose. It was to point you to Him. It was to point you to Jesus. Why is that? How is that? How does that work? How does the law bring us to Christ? Well, the law shows us that we're sinless. And it points us to the only one who isn't sinless. In other words, the law, if you try to keep the law, it wouldn't take long till you realize, man, I'm a low-down, sorry, rotten sinner, and I can't stop sinning. As hard as I try, I still mess up and do something wrong. 
And thank God, under the law, when you did something wrong, you could bring a sacrifice. But when you got under that law, it would become plain really quick. I am not sinless. I'm a sinner. And then if you're under the law and you look at Jesus, who was also under the law, you would see something very different between you and him. He never sinned one time, but it seems like I can't stop sinning. The harder I try, the more I seem to mess up. So the law should show you there's one sinless person, and that's all there's ever been. And that sinless one is Jesus Christ. What does the law say about sinlessness? Well, let's look at, um, first of all, let's look at Acts 15.10, and let's look at some verses that, that prove that Jesus was without sin. So Acts 15.10, I like this. Old Peter stands up and says something, probably the smartest thing he ever said. <laughs> Peter stands up, and he asks a question. Because there were some Gentiles that got saved, we're in Acts chapter 15, and uh, someone came in and said, now you've got to put him under the law. And Peter goes, come on, wait a minute. Under the law, we're saved by grace through faith, verse 11. So verse 10, Peter asks the questions. Now wherefore, why tempt ye God? To put a yoke upon the neck of disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Peter says, if I said Paul, I'm sorry. Peter says, why are you trying to put them back under this yoke that we couldn't even do? Our forefathers couldn't keep the law without sinning. We can't keep the law without sinning. We do our best, but we can't. The law shows us, hey man, we're a bunch of sinners. Why on earth would you try to put somebody under that? When all that does is point to him and we're saved by him. The sinless one, as, as it says in Peter, the just for the unjust. So, who was Jesus? Well, the Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. Did he ever sin? Not once. We live in a day and age of utter foolishness, in which people write books, like this, this book written called the Da Vinci Code, in which they try to say Jesus married a woman, and then from that woman he produced children, and those children are the Illuminati, or whoever you want to call them, that uh, can claim their descendancy from the seed of Christ and say that well, we're the rulers and the rightful rulers of the earth because Jesus is our Father. That's self. That's foolish. Jesus never got married, and Jesus never committed an act of fornication. So why would someone make such a stupid idea? Jesus died for us, and Jesus' seed is through the seed of Abraham. He is the promised seed. We're, we are the seed of Christ, it says in Galatians. But he didn't have a physical seed. Jesus didn't have sex or fornicate or make produce children. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh who had a specific purpose. He fulfilled that purpose on the cross and he will be married in the future. He does have a bride. His bride is the church, the bride of Christ. But he wasn't married down here on earth. That's ridiculous. Hebrews 4.15 says, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched without the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ was without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 So Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, came down, fulfilled the law, that is, he kept the law his entire life, 33 years, and he never sinned one time. Had he sinned, he couldn't have died for us. He could only die in our place for us to redeem us from the curse of the law by not sinning. He's the only one that could ever stay to the law. Ha! I can I defeated you. You know, I I overcame. I I have the victory over you because you did not curse me. I never sinned. I obeyed it and all. Second Corinthians 5:21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Notice that it's talking about Jesus Christ who knew no sin. Jesus Christ never sinned, not once. And because he didn't sin, he was able to die as our sinless substitute in our place. He shed his blood for us. He is our sacrifice without blemish. So what about the law? Romans 7, 4 through 6. What, what about the law now? Where's the law fit today? Do, do we have to get saved by faith but then keep the law as these people in Galatians are trying to teach? As modern Christianity tries to force the two together? Well, what does the Bible say about it? Romans 7, 4 through 6. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So I'm dead to the law. That means I don't keep the law. The law is behind me. I have nothing to do with the law. I'm dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be buried to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's what the law is. It's death. And then it says, 
But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, yea, I had not known sin but the, by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So what does it say here? It says we are dead to the sin, or dead to the law, and we are delivered. So, if we are delivered from the law, then that means we don't have to keep the law. So how could anyone tell you you got to keep the law to be saved, or, or say you got to keep the law to stay saved, if we are delivered from the law and we are dead to the law? Many times I've mentioned Romans 10.4. Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. So if you believe, then the law is dead to you. You're delivered from the law. That law has no more dominion over you if you're a Christian. Now, people will automatically say, well, then that means I can do whatever I want, and I can sin, and I can, I can fornicate and adulterate and do whatever. I... You, you can do that, but you shouldn't. You, you can do certain things, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. The Bible says there's a sin unto death. The Bible says you reap what you sow. If you're a Christian and you do something wrong, well, guess what? You reap what you sow. You can't go to hell. You're saved. Your soul is saved, but your body still has sinful desires. And if you give in to the desires of the flesh, then God will chastise you, and you will pay for your sin here. You can't go to hell because Jesus paid for your hell on the cross. But you sure can go through hell on earth if you decide to do wrong rather than doing right. And that's something different, completely different study. So let's go back to Genesis chapter, Genesis, excuse me, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, we're going to get done with this here real soon. He says, verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we should, might be justified by faith. So the law has fulfilled what it was made for. It was made to bring us to Christ. When you come to Christ and trust Him as your Savior, then the law is done. It's over. It's behind you. It's, it's, its job is over. It's done what it's supposed to do. Point you to Jesus. Now you're dead to the law, and you're delivered from it, and you're liberated. You're saved. You're forgiven through Christ. And it says in verse 25, But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. That means when you are saved, you're free from the law. So where does that put the law? Where is the law? Well, that's a good question. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Where is the law today for a Christian? Where is the law today for a Christian? Go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. This is, this is important. This is so important. If you don't listen to anything else, listen to this. Colossians 2, 14. The Bible says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What is that? That's the Old Testament law. Which was contrary to us and it's speaking of Jesus, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So where is the law today? I'm running out of room up here. Here's the cross of Calvary. Where is the law? The law is right here. It's been nailed there with nails. And it's been hammered in. So God, basically, it's like he took a hammer and nailed the law to the cross. So if you try to tell someone they have to keep the law to be saved, what are you doing? You're going to the cross and you're trying to say, yeah, yeah, that's the place where Jesus died to pay for the law, but I don't want it there. I want it to me. And it's trying, you're trying to literally nail it to yourself and say, look at me. Now I've got the law and it's nailed to me where it should be. No. The law is over. It's done. We're delivered from it. It's dead. It's nailed to the cross. We are no longer under the law. One of my favorite paintings that we have here at the house and there's not much to it, it's just a painting that someone made, is this one here. It's an awesome painting, I love looking at this. I don't know if you can see it, but what's it a picture of? It's a picture of the cross of Calvary, and it's the law is nailed to the cross. And then it quotes this verse on the bottom. One of my favorite paintings, it's just amazing to, to think that that's where the law is. So if the law is there, we should leave it there. Why are we trying to pull it down and put it to ourselves? Why are churches who claim to be Christian try to say, no, but we've got to keep the law? When the law is gone, it's over. It's nailed to the cross. Leave it there, because that's where Jesus put it. Why would you take it down after he put it there? That's crazy. So, let's go to verse 26, and we're almost done here with this, this chapter, Galatians chapter 3. So back to um, 
Galatians chapter 3 and verse 25. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. This is verse 26. So we become the children of God, the sons of God, by faith in Christ Jesus. There are people today, they're called universalists, other ones called Unitarians, and they believe in what they call the brotherhood of man. And they say, we are all the children of God. Well, is that true? No, because this verse says, we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That means if a person is not saved by trusting Jesus, they're not a child of God. But these people, they try to say, everyone's a child of God. No, you're not. You're not a child of God until you believe, until you're born again, until you're saved. Verse 27, for as many of you as been, have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now this is talking about spiritual baptism. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse 13, I believe we might have looked at this a little earlier, but let's look at it again. What is this talking about? Over in Ephesians it says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. A lot of people say, well that's water baptism. Well they're forgetting one thing. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit when you receive it. How does that happen? What takes place? 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. We're baptized with the Holy Spirit the moment we believe. We've looked at it before, Ephesians 1, 13. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, the moment you trust Him as your Savior, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you have the Holy Spirit. That's a Holy Spirit baptism that you receive the moment you believe. Romans chapter 6 talks about it as well. And it's odd to me that so many ministers that practice water baptism will come to Romans chapter 6 and say that that's water baptism. It's not. There's not a drop of water there. You can't find water with a finding machine in this passage of Scripture in Romans 6. It's talking about spirit baptism. Now let's read it real quick. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? This is spirit baptism. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, and like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So that's baptism in the Spirit. When you're saved, you have spirit baptism. You've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside you. That all goes back to the promise of receiving the Holy Spirit. So that's spiritual baptism. Now let's, uh, let's go back to Galatians, try to finish this up. We're getting pretty close to going a little long here. So Galatians chapter 3. In verse 26, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So we all become God's children when we believe. It's only through belief and faith that you become a child of God. And when you believe, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. But as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And then verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. So one in the body of Christ. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians 10.32. And this is important. A lot of people don't understand this. And this is something you've got to nail down. <coughs> pun intended. <laughs> but you've got to nail this down. In the Bible, God only sees three groups today. Now, where can I put this? Well, Alright, let's just do here. There are three groups of people in the church age today. There's, well, I'll read the verse and then show you. 1 Corinthians 10.32 Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So there's only three groups alive today. Lost Jews, lost Gentiles, or if you're saved, you're a part of the church of God. So in this world today, there's only three groups in the eyes of God. There's the people that are literally Jews that have their descendancy from, from Abraham, and they're lost. And there's people that are Gentiles that have never been saved that are alive today. But when a person gets saved, they're no longer Jew or Gentile. They're part of the church of God. So it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. When you get saved, you're no longer one of those. You're now part of the church of God. So those are the three groups that God sees 
from heaven in the church age. And if you're one of the first two, you're going to end up in hell when you die. That's why you need to come the way God set it up for us to be saved today, through faith in Christ, what He's done, His death, burial, and resurrection, faith in the gospel, faith in the blood, and then you become part of the church, His body, the body of Christ. So back to chapter 12, or excuse me, chapter 3 of Galatians, and verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if you be in Christ, that is in the body of Christ, then guess what you are? Abraham's seed, spiritually. Some call this being a spiritual Jew, <laughs> which is an interesting thing. And it says you're heirs. Well, heirs of what? Well, we're heirs of eternal life. We have salvation. Now, the Jewish nation, after the church age, in the millennium, will be literally heirs of the kingdom. That's why after the rapture, the church age, after the rapture, then God begins dealing with the Jews again, and in the millennium, he gives them their land. But right now, God deals with us as part of the church. Either a Jew or a Gentile gets saved. They're now part of the body of Christ, the church. And what are we heirs of? We're heirs of eternal life. But the Jews over here in the millennium, what are they heirs of? Well, they're heirs of this kingdom, and they get that kingdom. And the ch church is also heirs of spiritual blessings, as we looked at last time, like joy and peace and you know, happiness in the Holy Ghost. So that ends our reading of Galatians chapter 3, going verse by verse. Wow, what a lot of stuff to... Uh, to study. <laughs> and we all crammed it in there. I felt like I went a little too fast. But what should you have gotten out of this study? Well, you should have gotten probably the most important thing that you could ever tell anybody is that we're not saved by the law. We're saved by faith in the finished work and the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? I always try to add it in here. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. If you don't know that, go read it. Go look it up. That's how we're saved today. It's all about Him what he's done, it's not the law. And when we're saved, become part of this promise, seed to Abraham, we become part of the promise, we receive the Holy Spirit. We're saved by the Holy Spirit. You see how important it is to study the Bible, go verse by verse and learn it, so we don't get messed up and fall into false doctrine? How could I be a Seventh-day Adventist? I can't, because they say you've got to keep the law. How could I be a Pentecostal? I can't, because they say, oh, you can get saved and have Jesus as your Savior, but not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You have to be baptized later when you speak in tongues. No, the Bible says you receive it the moment you believe. How could I uh, be a Catholic? When the Catholics teach something, they teach there's two mediators. Jesus is a mediator, but Mary too, and you can come to God through Mary. How, how can I fall into a false religious setup if I understand, going verse by verse and just simply reading the Bible, and rightly dividing, how could I fall into a false religious organization? You can't. That's why it's so important to read the Bible, study the Bible, and do what it says. So I appreciate y'all being here. Next time we will begin in Galatians chapter 4. And uh, this has been a very important study to me. I really, really, really enjoy the book of Galatians. And it's because I'm so thankful I'm saved by grace through faith. I'm so glad it's not the law that saves. It's what he did for us. It's all about Jesus. Amen. So thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. God bless.